Good morning, Rio. My name is Eric Most. I'm an elder here at Rio Vista Community Church. I also have the honor to serve as the lead of the discipleship program down the road at Calvary Christian Academy. Uh, some of your kids I may have taught, some I have yet to teach. That's also an honor and a joy and a privilege for the most part. Um, depends on the kid. Uh, but again, we, uh, we love what we do over there. It's great to be here with you all. I love kind of being in both worlds. It, it gives me some cool perspective. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Let me pray really quick just one more time. We are going to dive right into our text. So, so pray alongside me. Lord, we're just grateful for this opportunity. And I pray that you would speak through this sinner to these sinners. That together that we would just come to know what it is to glorify you more. That we would reorient ourselves to the gospel of grace just a little bit more. That some eternal movement would take place in the coming minutes. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to rewind to 2001. I'm in fourth grade and I'm begging my mom to allow me to stay up later. Why? Perhaps to watch Boy Meets World or even Stevens, millennials, you're connecting with me, everyone else, you might be a little confused. Uh, or God forbid that show, The Simpsons. No, I didn't want to stay up to watch any of those shows. I wanted to read Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I couldn't quite articulate it then. But there was a narrative device in that book that kept my attention over and over and over. I was entirely enthralled by these two parallel worlds coexisting yet separate. There were these two worlds in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets that were both happening at the same time, but they were separated by this thin veil, this permeable layer. Let me explain a little bit more. You had the snake in the Chamber of Secrets operating around the, the in and through the walls and under the floor. But at the same time, you had Hogwarts, normal, everyday school. The kids were doing their thing. Quidditch was being played. But those two realities coexisted, but were separate. And the, the, the story's points of tension, of highest tension, is when those two worlds intersected. So when Harry went down into the Chamber of Secrets, for example, that was sort of the climax of that story. Fast forward to two, uh, 2022, I'm 31, and I'm begging my wife to stay up later. Why? To watch The Office? Usually yes, but not this time. This time it's to watch Stranger Things. Why? Like Harry Potter, the same narrative device is used. There are these two coexisting yet opposite realities separated by a thin, permeable layer. They overlap. And the points of the story of Stranger Things that get most intense are when those two sort of coexisting realities intersect through whatever portal or whatever uh, you may be watching, right? You have normal life in Hawkins, Indiana, and yet the Upside Down exists parallel to it, separated by those portals. portals. A similar dynamic unfolds in our text today. The focus of the text is the temple. And the temple represents two realities coexisting, separated, yet overlapping. The glory of God is one of those realities, and the sinfulness of man is the other reality. As Jesus approaches this monumental space, this space of overlap, he's asking them and us a significant question. Are we, the people of God, demonstrating genuine worship, prayer, and godliness, or are we living hollow lives draped in religious, you know, activity? Put differently, are you using religious routine as a Trojan horse to conceal other ungodly motives and desires? Let me just whittle it down to maybe a basic question. Does faith ultimately make a difference in your life, in my life? I want to unpack this narrative and this question in four ways. I want to look at the background, the expectation, the reality, and ultimately the fulfillment. All right? So background, expectation, reality, fulfillment. Let's dive in. First, the background. As I mentioned through the parallels of Harry Potter and Stranger Things, the focal point, the setting, and the most important aspect of Mark's gospel here in this text is the temple. In order to understand the significance of Jesus' actions in the temple, you have to understand the significance of the temple in the first place. So let's do that really quickly from a 30,000-foot view. If you took the route that Jesus takes in our text, cresting over the Mount of Olives, 
you would have seen a panoramic view of Jerusalem. And the most unavoidable structure you would see as you come over the Mount of Olives is the Temple and the Temple Mount. This is a modern-day depiction of that. It would have looked different 2,000 years ago. But you get a sense of, as you're cresting over the Mount of Olives, the focal point is right in front of you. That's the biggest, the, the sort of the focal point of this journey that Jesus has taken as he's cresting the Mount of Olives. The temple then ultimately was the place where earth overlaps with God's heavenly home. The temple was symbolic. They didn't believe ultimately that God was sort of housed and domesticated in those four walls that he's like sipping coffee in the Holy of Holies. Rather, it was symbolic that the fact that all of creation was God's temple. That's because the temple ultimately, again, talking about the background, it has rich historical background reaching all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2. The Garden of Eden ultimately demonstrates that overlap between God and humanity in perfect harmony. And yet, as we are aware, Adam and Eve desecrated that sacred space. They were banished from it. And one of the overarching themes of the Bible is getting back to the garden, is recovering that shalom. Whereas in Eden, heaven and earth were perfectly overlaid, not overlapped, but overlaid, sin severed that reality. And yet God, in his grace, through various means, creates opportunities for humanity to regain a little of what was lost in Eden. So throughout the Old Testament, we see imagery of humanity's quest to regain that shalom. We see it in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the portable temple where Yahweh would descend to meet his people, once hearkening back again to that divine and human overlap. We also see it in the the temple. Once Israel was more established in the promised land, more permanent, that temple, not coincidentally, is full of garden imagery. Once again, this is a space of sacred overlap. It's where those two parallel realities coexist yet remain separate. In the temple, we see a yearning ultimately to return to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 and 2. Both were guarded by angels. Both were oriented to the east. Both had one way in and one way out. We see the menorah representing the tree of life. The temple is the place where God dwells with his people. In the temple, the Israelite priests and Levites were to work and keep the temple in God's presence, which is the exact charge given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The one distinct feature of the temple that we can't miss, though, is a thick veil separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And that thick veil, again, is a painful reminder that Eden has not yet been regained. With that background in place and understood, as Jesus makes his way towards the temple, we should have immense expectations. Why? Because a man making substantial messianic claims and demonstrating compelling messianic miracles is making his way into this sacred space of overlap. So set against the history of Israel, you can't overestimate the gravity of this scene. What might we expect to happen? Let's dig into some details of the text. In verse 4, we read that Jesus calls for a colt to ride into Jerusalem. It's worth mentioning here, nowhere else in the Gospels do we read of Jesus riding. Almost exclusively, we see him walking. Why would he be doing that now? One commentator puts it this way. The staged arrival in Jerusalem deviates from Jesus' previous attempts to avoid calling attention to himself. His magnetic power and miracles made his desire to keep a low profile next to impossible. Nevertheless, he consistently tried to elude starstruck crowds whose excitement threatened to turn his mission into a carnival. We're familiar with this if we know the Gospels. Jesus always, you know, performed miracles and then instructed people not to tell anybody. But it's different here. What occurs now is a complete reversal. Jesus encourages public rejoicing by his provocative entrance. Why might this be? Let's consider Zechariah 9.9, which reads this. Rejoice greatly, O O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
Jesus is ultimately making an open, messianic, kingly claim, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. It invites us to consider David. Let's think back to 2 Samuel. In it, we find King David fleeing Jerusalem by the way of Mount of Olives, weeping, riding a donkey. In Mark 11 and its parallel accounts, we find King Jesus entering Jerusalem by way of the Mount of Olives, weeping over the city, also riding a donkey. The parallels are pretty remarkable. So taking these two things into account, you have an incredibly charged scene. You have the most controversial figure of the day, marching towards the most monumental location of the day on perhaps the most religiously charged week of the year in Passover. The expectation of the people in light of this scene is that Jesus is coming as that prototypical monarch that they would be familiar with, that they would be expecting, establishing a mere earthly empire. They presume, ultimately, that he's entering Jerusalem to purge the nation of Roman domination and revive those ancient glories of Israel. Conversely, the expectation of Jesus as he approaches the temple is that true, genuine worship would be found in that sacred space of overlap. As we will see, neither expectation is the reality. In our text, notice that Jesus actually visits the temple twice. Once in the evening, after the final leg of his journey, this is sort of a reconnaissance mission, it seems like, And as he goes and observes all the comings and goings of the temple, what should he have seen? The Psalms ultimately give us a hint. He should have seen God being worshipped as supreme treasure. Consider Psalm 8411, which reads, A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Or Psalm 7325, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire Besides you, this is the type of worship Jesus should have seen unfolding before him in the temple. He, in fact, did not see that genuine, heartfelt worship of God in this sacred space. He saw quite a different reality. Instead, he saw hollow religious ritual. He saw spiritual busyness, but no spiritual reality. He saw external, outward, churchy actions with zero heart change. The focus on God in our text and in the temple had ultimately been replaced by a focus on trade. And let me back up a little bit to unpack what is really happening, what's really going on, the things that Jesus is witnessing in the temple. Passover tradition would require pilgrims from faraway places to make an animal sacrifice. And so due to the long nature of their travel, they wouldn't necessarily bring the animal with them along the journey. They would ultimately buy one in Jerusalem once they got there. And keep in mind too, those animal sacrifices had to be unblemished. So the likelihood of them taking an animal from Galilee all the way to Jerusalem and that animal being unblemished by the time they got to Jerusalem is very low. So ultimately as as a, a, a pretty wise move, they would then therefore by an unblemished sacrifice once they got to Jerusalem. So if you're an opportunistic businessman in first century, this is a pretty lucrative opportunity for you. If you're selling livestock, you're going to turn over some change in the week of Passover. Ancient historian Josephus tells us in one Passover week, 255,000 lambs were bought and sold and sacrificed in the temple courts. Think of that, 255,000 lambs in one week. And so as the temple is being used for this scheme, the anger of Jesus is directed at those selling and handling the currency. It's not necessarily directed at the pilgrims mainly. It's more so directed at the religious experts who are leveraging this situation for their own personal gain. Jesus could see through the veneer of religious helpfulness ultimately to their corrupt heart, to the thing that they were really after. What should have been a sacred space of overlap has been greedily turned into a bazaar, an emporium, a flea market. And I want you to just stop for a minute and think of that number, 255,000 lambs being bought and sold and exchanged. Think about what you're seeing, what you're smelling, what you're hearing, what should be unfolding as true and genuine worship towards the one true living God. Instead, you're hearing bartering and bleeding, and clopping, and yelling. It's like a first century New York Stock Exchange, something to that effect, right? Um, It's not genuine worship of God, and it stokes the anger of Jesus. It was not flowing from the love of God. 
Outwardly, it had all of the trappings of worship, but inwardly was serving a completely different purpose. A religious ruse was obscuring what the people were really after. I want to pause here because I think this is where our text gets really applicable. I think this is where it really hits home. How frequently have we as the people of God constructed this elaborate facade of external religiosity without paying attention to the true renovation of our hearts? We go to church every Sunday. We send our kids to Christian schools. We volunteer. We get involved with programs. We serve on boards. We're in small groups. All of these are very good things and things we should continue to do. But without genuine, personal, real communion with God, those things are just religious activity hiding a hollow heart. We tend to have this inverse relationship between religious activity and treasuring God. And let me give a hypothetical example. So let's just say, hypothetically, that there's a 15-year-old in 2007 that was radically saved by God in the foothills of North Carolina at a young life camp called Sharp Top Cove, hypothetically. And let's say in that moment, in his mind, Christ is big. Christ, the the, the idea of, of his sin being forgiven, the idea of a savior, a personal, genuine relationship with God, big. Now, over time, that individual, he gets involved in more Christian activity, goes to Christian college, graduates, takes a job at a Christian institution, you know, involved in a Christian church, gets married, raising kids, all of those things, religious activity starts to grow and grow and grow and grow. And without careful attention to who Christ was and is in that first moment, this inverse reality starts to happen. All of those activities, which are good things in and of themselves, they grow And in all likelihood, like, let's just be honest, Christ can shrink if we're not careful about renovating our hearts again and again and again. And the ones conducting all this temple business, that reality is ultimately happening to them. A different reality has has consumed their hearts and choked out the life-giving breath of the one true reality, the one true living God Uh, In Yahweh. And that's the crazy thing. In verse 18, it says the chief and priests and the scribes, they were the ones that were most angry at Jesus' actions. When in reality, they should be the ones that would be like, "Ah, you know what, you're right. This is ridiculous. Let's clean all this up. Let's reform this. Come on, everybody get out. But they were the ones that were most angry. It's a picture of how far they had really drifted from Jesus. In many ways, again, they're pictures of us. Good at maintaining religious exteriors while missing the main point of it all. A friend puts it this way. He says, it's the spiritual equivalent of going on a date and focusing on all of your table manners while completely neglecting the person across the table and not learning a thing about them. It's the spiritual equivalent of not committing a single foul or a traveling violation, yet losing the game by 100 points. It's the equivalent of two planes in the air, one whose engine is roaring strong and the other whose engine has just died. To the observer on the ground, for a while, both of those planes look the same. One is thriving, one will inevitably meet its demise. It's the equivalent of staying in the lanes, not rolling a stop sign, never speeding, but ending up in New York as opposed to your intended destination of L.A. Paul understood this reality. In 2 Timothy 3, he says this, Understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal. Come on, Paul, geez. Not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now pause. As I'm reading that, you're all thinking, my gosh, who is he talking about? Like, this is going to be good. I can't wait for him to just name and call out whoever this is. Verse 5, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. He's talking about us. The crazy reality is, On the outside, you can have the appearance of godliness. And on the inside, being truly, actually, and really all of those things. Did you you pay attention? I mean, those, those are crazy things. And yet, on the outside, you can maintain an image of godliness. 
That's what's going on in the temple. That's what's going on in many of our hearts. In our text, in between the temple visits, Jesus offers an object lesson from a fig tree. And I've always found this really confusing until uh, Tim Keller explained it to me as I, I studied for this text. Keller notes that Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern fig trees, they bore two kinds of fruit. As the leaves came in the spring, figs came along with them. But the branches also, before the figs, they bore these little nodules that, you know, travelers would kind of pop off and eat along the way. I imagine it's like the equivalent of sunflower seeds at a baseball game. Um, travelers, they'd pick them off and they'd eat them as they made their journey. So if you found a fig tree with leaves, so in leaf, like our text says, but none of the nodules, you would know that something's wrong. From a distance, it would look good as you approach it because it would be in leaf, but as you got closer, you would recognize that the absence of those nodules would indicate that the tree was diseased and potentially dying on the inside. You see the picture? It's very consistent with what's going on in the temple. The people expected Jesus as an ally to pronounce judgment on Rome, external expectation from a distance. Instead, ultimately, Jesus pronounces judgment on them, internal. The crowd expected Jesus to save them from their enemies, external. Instead, Jesus says, no, that's not your biggest problem. You need to be saved from yourself. The tree was a perfect metaphor for Israel and perhaps a metaphor for us as well. As I believe the text is inviting us to examine our own hearts in light of the realities that are unfolding in our text before us. Are you keeping this perfectly manicured outer shell such that we look good from a distance as these trees do, but as you get closer and closer and closer, we are wasting away on the inside. I think in light of what Jesus is getting at, many of us are more like the money changers, more like the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests than we like to admit. And perhaps many of us for years have been keeping up appearances without vibrantly valuing God as we should, as the psalmists talk about. So what do we do? Jesus ultimately wasn't the king that people expected. He didn't overcome Rome. They would have been incredibly disappointed when at the end of this holy week, he just submitted quietly to the Roman authorities. Those were the people he was supposed to overthrow and instead they overthrew him. But in reality, Jesus was a different kind of king. He was the true king. He was the true prophet. He was the true priest. And rather than use the temple of his body for personal gain, Jesus, the true king, empties his body for the gain of others, even unto death. And through that death, that burial, that resurrection, and his ascension, Jesus single-handedly wins back that sacred space that was lost in Eden. If you've been tracking with me, you probably saw this coming, but most times old truths are the best truths. Later in Mark's gospel in chapter 15, he recounts what happens at the end of this week that began in our text today. We are back in that same focal point of our text, that liminal overlap space between transcendence and imminence. It's the temple. And in Mark 15, 38, we read that that temple veil that I mentioned earlier, that thick black veil was torn in two. And it's worth mentioning, this wasn't some flimsy veil. It was heavy. It was thick. It was almost as substantial as a wall. And it separated the people from the presence of God. Back to that idea of two existing realities, yet separate. The curtain said loudly and clearly that people who are faking their way through life with God, people who are wearing these external masks, people who are manicured on the outside but hollowing away on the inside, the curtain said that those people not bearing fruit could not access the presence of God. And in its tearing at the death of Christ, Jesus makes a way for those type of people to come to him. He purifies their half-hearted worship. By his spirit, he enlivens their distracted hearts that keeps running after other things. Jesus is now happier to love sinners than sinners are to be loved by him. Let me say that again. Jesus is now happier to love sinners than sinners are to be loved by him. It's what he came to do. The work is finished, and now he just gets to apply it in your life over and over and over again. As the sacrificial king, Jesus establishes a new temple, and he welcomes those repentant sinners. 
his reign and his jurisdiction. It's no longer a, you know, a fixed place in Jerusalem, but it is indeed through his death and resurrection. It's making its way throughout all the earth. It's spreading. In 1914, British explorer Ernest Shackleton took a trip to Antarctica. And their plan was to cross over the South Pole and make it all the way across to continue that expedition. And their plans were foiled when their ship, the Endurance, it got caught in polar ice and was ultimately crushed. Over the following months, the crew, they, thought, they, they fought just to survive and get home. One of Shackleton's biographers says that of all the difficulties they faced, including starvation and frigid temperatures, the worst of all was the darkness. Near the South Pole, you may be familiar, the sun goes down in mid-May and it doesn't come back up again until late July, like period, like complete darkness for over two months. There's no daytime, no sunlight for more than two months. That's what they endured. And in many ways, as we have lost Eden and as we are not yet reached the full and final home that we were intended for, in many ways, as we live on this earth, we feel that darkness. Some of it is our own fault. Much of it is. Some of it isn't. We still have a ways to go. But in the death of Christ and in the establishment of this new temple, the sun is rising and the darkness is receding. Slow, yes, but inevitable, yes. We can live ultimately with confident hope, confident joy, knowing that one day our sin will be fully gone and we'll be fully free. We'll have no choice but to genuinely worship Jesus in his true and better temple and spirit and in truth. Isaiah 55 speaks of a day where the mountains and the hills, they break out into singing and the trees clap. This is a vivid picture of Eden reimagined, of, of the true Eden established and rooted and grounded on this earth of the temple no longer being constrained to walls and ceilings, but peace being spread once more to all the earth. And on that day, all of this life will feel even less real than heaven may feel to you now. And heaven will feel more real than this does right now. Because of Jesus in the temple, the temple we were always intended for, there will be no more, no more, Variants or masks for that matter. No more sleepless nights fretting for the next day's meeting. No more texts that throw your entire week into disarray or calls or emails. No more anxiety that you're behind in life watching everyone pass you up. There'll be no more tense conversations with coworkers. In that new temple, there'll be no more alarm clocks or dentist appointments. There'll be no more comparison that makes you feel inadequate or insecure. There'll be no more nights where, if you have young kids, you might get this. There'll be no more nights where you collapse on the couch wondering how you're going to find the energy to do it again the next day. There'll be no more ongoing bodily pain. There'll be no more incurable diseases. That's the kind of temple that Jesus desires and creates. One that naturally elicits true, genuine worship. So in light of that, you might just be asking, all right, what are you inviting me to do? So what? I'm asking you to be re-enchanted with Jesus. If you have lived this Christian life, really good at Christian activity, but you forgot your first love, I'm asking you to return to that first love. I'm asking you to create space and silence in your day and your schedule intentionally. I'm asking you to maybe reread Narnia, revisit that childlike faith, and then reread the Gospel of John. Say, oh yeah, it's all there. It's all there. Regain that childlike faith that may have hardened through years of religious activity and maybe church hurt, and whatever the, the case may be. And ultimately, to recover the Gospel of grace and then tend the new temple of Jesus Christ that is unfolding here on earth. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for your gospel. And God, we ask that, Lord, you would renovate our hearts, that you would enliven our worship, God, that we would return to our first love, that we would see you as you truly are, and that all the religious activity, 
would be reinvigorated by just a vision of who you are, rooted and grounded in the glorious grace that you have won for us through your death and your resurrection, creating this new temple that we now advance here on earth. It's in your name we pray.